Anyway, well, thank you. Yes, my name is Anthony Bly. I'm a soils field specialist with South Dakota State University Extension. And uh, what I'd like to share with you is a long-term project that started back in 2003. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, other authors and collaborators. It's been a big project over those years. Dr. Ron Gelderman has since retired. Uh, Mr. Jim Gerwing is retired as well. Uh, I worked uh, for them uh, doing soil fertility work and so forth uh, uh, from the early 90s on. And then Dr. Sandeep Kumar has come on, a wonderful soil physicist that uh, I enjoy working with very much. And then his graduate student, Ekram, um, uh, did a lot of kind of uh, analysis of this project that I'm going to talk to you about um, in, in the next few slides. First of all, I'd like to just kind of humor, humor you a little bit here. Uh, this, this is what I had to deal with uh, for about 10 years of the project that I was involved with it. I was the one that uh, uh, did the logistics on the manure and, and so forth. And uh, um, so I was hauling this to the field for application uh, one year and thought uh, I should share that. Um, our experiment station director was very sensitive to these things because he got a lot of complaints from the neighborhood about our livestock facilities. And, and uh, this day, this spreader uh, dripped all along the road and I had to go clean it up about a mile and a half of road. I, I walked to scoop that stuff off of there. But anyway, the project uh, includes a couple sites here at Beersford, South Dakota, which is about 50 miles south of Sioux Falls, our largest city in South Dakota, and at Brookings, where, camp, where our SDSU campus is, which is about 50 miles north of Brookings. Corn soybean rotation there. Uh, fortunately, at Brookings, we had to establish a new site in 2008 because we had lost, lost our site to a research park. But anyway, uh, uh, the site in Beersford had uh, beef uh, feedlot manure applied to it, and the site in Brookings had dairy uh, lagoon manure daily scraped from a barn uh, applied to that for that period of time. The objectives back in 2003 were very simple. Uh, uh, large animal feeding operations were just coming into our state at that time. Uh, chickens had left South Dakota. Um, pretty much and the hogs were, were coming in and big big barns were being built. And so um, our Department of Ag um, had to establish some uh, regulations for, for those CAFOs. And so our, our project was initiated to uh, do three things. Determine if the manure management approaches that, that uh, were regulating these CAFOs were sufficient to supply, to supply nutrients to the crop. And we wanted to look at the uh, phosphorus buildup in the soil uh, following the nitrogen or phosphorus-based management plans. And then, we, of course, we wanted to look at the nitrogen carryover as well. So uh, kind of a three, three objectives there that we wanted to look at. This slide, I'm going to take a little bit of time uh, going over. It's the, the treatments of this study. Uh, of course, we had a check with no fertilizer or manure applied. Uh, we had a recommended uh, fertilizer. Uh, treatment based on soil test levels and the university um, recommendations. A third treatment was a phosphorus-based manure uh, rate based upon the uh, crop phosphorus needs. Uh, the fourth treatment was a manure-based uh, rate of manure based upon the crop's nitrogen needs. And then as good scientists do, we just doubled the, the, the manure N rate. So that's the manure two N rate. And then um, we added a high fertility rate later, later in the study, about halfway through, where we um, felt we wanted to make sure that, that uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and zinc were non-limiting. Uh, we didn't go overboard with those rates, but we, we went uh, uh, much above our, our recommended fertility rate. So a slide that's kind of busy, but summarizes the uh, amounts of manure that had been applied to these plots between 2003 and 2014, based upon these, these approaches. Um, of course, the Brookings site there, um, this is only showing the last seven years of that data because we switched sites. Uh, but the, the Beersford site uh, has all 12 years. And you can see, uh, of course, the increasing amounts of manure amounts of manure based upon the uh, management approach. But look at the total amounts of nutrients that we've applied to some of these plots. It's just astronomical. I mean, huge amounts of phosphorus and potassium. 
And uh, so we're going to look at the effect of those on soil test level and, and of course, soil health of focus here. So I got to kind of got to get moving. Uh, just one picture of the plots at Beersford uh, showing the uh, uh, phosphorus rate uh, based uh, treatment on the left hand side of the screen and the uh, 2N nitrogen rate on the right hand side of the screen. So you can see uh, a big difference uh, in those in those treatments. First of all, the effect on phosphorus at Beersford, you can see that the uh, manure 2N rate greatly increased soil phosphorus there across those years. Uh, the manure N rate is right behind that. And then, and then closely in um, together down there, the manure phosphorus rate and the high fertility rate, which we would expect. And then the check and the recommended uh, rate of nutrients there at the bottom. Um, then we go to Brookings, and I do have all the years of the data in here, and you can see where the new site uh, was established there, and it's about the same same effect, um, where that manure 2N, uh, double the manure rate, was, was drastically increasing uh, soil test phosphorus. Here at this site, our check is, is drawing down the phosphorus because we're, we're about uh, three times the level we were at the other site, uh, so we're seeing that drawdown. And uh, you can see the other effect of the other treatments there as well. Um, I also wanted to look at the uh, the nit nitrate nitrogen in the in the soil in the fall. So I put those slides up because that was the third objective on um, for the original project. And we can see um, clearly that 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 over application of manure based upon nitrogen is 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 leaving some really high residual nitrate levels in the soil. And this is a two foot measurement. We use the two foot measurement in South Dakota uh, for our crops. We're in a much drier climate than, than most are. And so we can take a credit, credit for that residual nitrogen in the soil. Um, the, next, the next highest ones were the, the recommended rate of nitrogen and we're probably getting a lot of mineralization from that organic fraction out of, out of that. And then the uh, high fertility uh, once in a while had higher levels of nitrate nitrogen too. And that's Beersford and here's Brookings. Kind of the same story, um, although uh, uh, a little bit tighter, tighter uh, uh, values there. And, you know, I think, I think what we're doing here at the Brookings site is we're, you know, really building that carbon as well. And a lot of that nitrogen is, is in a sense being immobilized in that organic fraction. And so we're not picking it up in the nitrate nitrogen test. Yields, I wanted to show yields very quickly. Um, these are the soybean grain yields across those years and we had it. So when we had corn at Beersford, uh, that's the SE here, sorry about that, but we refer to Beersford as our Southeast farm. Um, so we had uh, corn at Beersford, Brookings, uh, Brookings would have been soybeans in that flip-flop. So we had each crop each year, but at a different location. And you can see in the early years of, of doing this work, we had, a lot of variability indicated by the non-significance between the treatments there. And then as our, our treatment plots um, settled out or established themselves, then, then we were picking up more, more significant differences between, between the treatments. And, and usually, usually the higher manure application rates returned, returned the greatest yields, although uh, uh, the recommended rate of nitrogen is probably the one that, that by and large would have been the highest one, but there is some variability there. Uh, here's the, um, the uh, results from, from corn, um, kind of the same things. Those first years, uh, not as many uh, significant differences there at the beginning, but then, but then at the end you can see, uh, indicated by those stars, uh, the significance come through. And um, um, uh, the manure treatments um, for corn especially, uh, you know, all yielded our recommended fertility rate uh, most of the time. And so, hence in South Dakota, we, you know, we think about um, uh, manure as black gold. Uh, a lot of producers are really honing in on this and realize how important it is uh, to, to, to maximize productivity. And I don't like to use that word, but um, that's, that's what they're thinking. And, and they know they can get higher yields if they use manure for their nutrients as compared to commercial fertilizer. And we measured that at our, at our research plots. Okay, so now into the soil health part. Uh, 
the part that sold this uh, webinar. And uh, I first wanted to give that background of that project and how important it is to have that established project uh, in place. So this student, Ekram Olzu, could come in and, and, and take some measurements, some soil health measurements, and really look at the long-term impact of these management systems on soil health. And so this is from his MS thesis. He measured pH, electrical conductivity, aggregate stability, um, organic uh, carbon, uh, bulk density, and water infiltration rate. So pH, uh, pH was uh, moderated or somewhat increased with the manure treatments. You can see he's got uh, PN and 2N would be the uh, manure treatments there on the bottom, indicated on the bottom. And in the, in the zero to 10 centimeter depth, uh, those treatments had a little bit higher pH than the other ones, um, especially the high fertility treatment which we can see that acidification coming in from the, from the excess nitrogen that's being applied from the commercial fertilizer. Uh, the other depths were relatively unaffected. At Beersford, same story, uh, the manure is having a, a somewhat of a liming effect, and we can see that the pH from the phosphorus, the nitrogen rate, and the two nitrogen rate manure treatments are, are much higher than the ones from the fertility treatment. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, high fertility treatment, the excessive uh, commercial fertilizer is nearing a 5.5 pH uh, compared to the 6.9 uh, with the manure treatments there. Uh, and again, uh, not any significant differences at the uh, deeper depths, but you can see that there is still some effect uh, going on there at the deeper soil depths. Um, I also included a look at pH across the years of the study. Um, you can see there that uh, same, same story, and this is for the six inch soil depth. Um, uh, the manure treatments tending to have higher, higher pH while the, uh, while the commercial fertilizer treatments uh, having lower pH. Um, and the check plot is somewhat right in the middle. And so kind of where we'd, where we'd expect it to be. A uh, little bit different results at Brookings, although uh, very similar, just uh, um, a little bit more tighter, tighter data and uh, not as much difference. But, uh, but again, the, uh, the commercial-based fertilizer treatments having the lower side on the pH and the, and the manure treatments uh, a little bit higher. Again, that uh, liming effect, if you will. Electrical conductivity was increased with, uh, with a 2N uh, manure rate there, uh, uh, which we expect that to happen, a little bit more salts in that manure. Um, and we see that effect more greatly at Brookings because those salts more contained in that lagoon from that, uh, that dairy facility. We're at Beersford, it's an open feedlot, and um, there is a containment lagoon around the feedlot that catches the runoff and, and so some of those salts are, are getting away into that water and then we're hauling the, the dry matter or the, uh, the manure on the aprons out to the plots. And you can see it elevated there, um, even with the phosphorus and nitrogen based treatments, it's elevated somewhat um, uh, when we compare it to the, to the commercial fertilizer treatments. Organic carbon increased uh, with, with the manure treatments there as well at all depths. At, uh, at the Beersford site, which is, which is really neat. Um, uh, one wouldn't really expect that lower depth influence, but it's clearly we're having, having an impact at the lower depths. Um, somewhat similar at Brookings as well. Um, uh, building, building carbon is so important as Dr. Snap has mentioned, and so uh, manure is really good for that. I showed the influence of organic matter uh, here in the zero to six inch depth across the years as well. And uh, we, we can see the more manure we put on, the higher the, uh, the organic matter is. And this is a loss on ignition measurement. And so we're going there from slightly above three and a half percent into the five uh, and as high as up to six percent there with, with added manure over that period of time from 2003 to 2014. Um, of course, that manure 2N rate isn't something we would recommend because of the environmental implications. Uh, another part of this study was to look at greenhouse gases, and, and sure enough, we had excess greenhouse gases released when we applied too much manure. 
above what we'd recommend for crop use. And so that's why we backed that off. But, but a really good, really good uh, uh, description there of what uh, adding, adding uh, an organic source to the soil can do. Same thing at the Brookings site, uh, the, the increase in organic matter, uh, uh, very clear there uh, once we switch sites. Um, and so um, a very, very, very neat depiction uh, of that effect as well. Wet aggregate stability, the aggregates that uh, Dr. Snap talked about, so important for soil health, uh, uh, just enabling water and air exchange in and out of the soil, uh, uh, essentially just uh, a very cornerstone, I, I think, in my opinion, uh, measurement for soil health. And, and we, see, we see the effect of manure on aggregate stability has increased, uh, uh, as highlighted here in the 2N uh, manure treatment. Um, that uh, that aggregate stability uh, uh, percentage there much much higher than than the uh, commercial fertilizer treatments or the check plot, and so uh, even the recommended rates of manure, uh, their uh, aggregate stability measurements are are greater than the commercial fertilizer uh, values. Uh, bulk density. Um, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of bulk density, but just the weight per Per volume of any given soil measurement, a uh, weight per volume measurement there, uh, decreased with uh, added additions of manure. And uh, that, that's uh, something that I think we're going to continue to have a problem with. And, and especially in the Midwest, our implements are getting so huge. Uh, we have 2,000 bushel grain carts and, and combines that are now, uh, uh, you know, just. Uh, uh, very huge, carrying three, four hundred bushels of grain in their grain carts, and so manure is showing here that uh, it can help, uh, uh, you know, with with bulk density issues compared to that check plot and the uh, commercial fertilizer plots. And of course, uh, the opposite of that, in my mind, infiltration rate. Uh, we have more porosity. Uh, we get more water to go into the soil, and so uh, that's measured here. Um, uh, those manure treatments uh, greatly affecting uh, water infiltration rate. And we know that uh, soils that have high organic matter, more carbon, uh, can store more water. And, uh, and so that we're having that influence here as well. So all positive things uh, on soil health from manure. So in summary, soil phosphorus and, and nitrate nitrogen were elevated uh, with over applications of both fertilizer or manure. And so we need to really watch that, and that's and that's why we work with our uh, uh, livestock operations and, and 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 educating them as to the the correct rates of manure to apply. And uh, yields were similar with fertilizer and manure, with manure tending to be higher in in some of those years, especially with corn. Uh, manure increased soil carbon and organic matter definitely, which is which is so important for for building soil health. Manure tending to have a, a liming influence while the fertilizer plots were showing acidification. And that's a new problem in South Dakota uh, where we're, we're really dropping our, our pHs in, in our fields that have not received any manure. And uh, that's one education uh, point that we continue to try to make is the a better management of our nitrogen fertilizers to prevent that from happening. Manure over application increasing soil salts, and so another uh, consideration that we really need to make uh, that supports uh, using manure as a, as a good uh, nutrient source done the right way. Uh, as Dr. Snap mentioned, the right source, the right rate, right time, and, and so forth. Uh, manure improves soil aggregation and water infiltration, uh, which, which I show in there, which is very important uh, for improved soil health. Present, prevents runoff, um, you know, and water quality issues as well. Manure decreased soil bulk density uh, was pretty clear, which is, which is very important for uh, plants and their rooting ability uh, in the soil and also water infiltration, it's all related. So overall, manure application improves soil health when compared to commercial fertilizer. <laughs> 